give you all the glory. You are worthy to be praised. God, we worship you. We thank you. We praise you. We acknowledge your presence today. We ask that you'd speak to us afresh and move as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. That's it. Go ahead and minister one more time. We give you all the glory. We worship you, our Lord. You are. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. There's a worship moment in this house. There's a worship moment in this house. There's a worship moment in this house. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Play it, play it, play it. Go ahead, go ahead. Give me some fire. Come on. One more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. going to take a couple minutes and just talk to you just in a few minutes. I, I won't be long this morning. Uh, as you know, I've been speaking from the theme, Do the Right Thing, and this is part two of Do the Right Thing. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Second Chronicles 7, and you know we've read the verses over and over again. Verse 14, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. That, that's the basis of this do the right thing. And of course, as is obvious to most of you, the right thing is, is prayer. That's the right thing. And I'm going to get at that in a number of different angles and ways and kind of discover with you what was in the mind of uh, the writer, what was in the mind of God as God spoke it. And, and this has been one of those kind of seasons where we need to um, re-examine our relationship with God, revive ourselves in the spirit, renew ourselves, reinvigorate ourselves in a fresh way. We actually need God to be revealed to us afresh because there's so much going on 
that is debilitating and uh, nearly depressive that, that we just, if we don't keep renewing our minds, then we will give in to our flesh and it'll be only what our eyes see that will determine how we feel. And, you know, you, you, you wake up with bad news and go to bed with bad news if you just keep watching the news. So much happens during the day uh, that, that you think you've gotten all the news that you can get until you wake up the next morning and find out there's overnight news from the devil. This season has revealed just how difficult life is. The former first lady, the beautiful sister, Michelle Obama, the first lady, recently revealed that because of the pandemic, because of racial injustice in the U.S., she's been experiencing what she described as low-grade depression. Now, now, wait a minute. Here's the former first lady, one of the most well-known African-American women in the world, who really in a moment of fresh candor speaks about mental health in a very significant way. It's a great moment for us to really examine. I want you to hear her in her own words. This is the audio that you just, just hear what she said. These are not, they, they are not fulfilling times spiritually. You know, um, so I, I know that I am dealing with uh, some form of low-grade depression, not just because of the quarantine, but because of the racial strife and just seeing this administration, watching the hypocrisy of it day in and day out is dispiriting. It's, it's true. It's difficult, but life has a way of pressing you there. And, and, and I want to make a point here at the very top of the message that, that I believe that Solomon had a clear sense of wisdom. And that wisdom was his first request from God. What would you have me to give you? I'm going, Solomon says, I want wisdom. And God says, I'm going to give you wisdom and then more, plus more. I'm going to give you riches and wealth and abundance. But his first request was wisdom. And I think that that wisdom is on display in these chapters, particularly chapter 6 and 7, after the temple is built. And Solomon has a, a, a real keen mind. And the first thing I think he has is a complete understanding of the vulnerability of people. A complete understanding of the vulnerability of people. He realizes that people are vulnerable, that we're vulnerable to, 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 to all the things that happen in life that can impinge upon us emotionally and spiritually and psychologically. We are vulnerable. Living makes you emotionally vulnerable to sadness. Just the reality. If you live at some point, something is going to happen to bring grief and sadness in your life. That's just the price of living. Living at some point will make you sorrow. Sorrow will be there as the part of the price of living. It's a part of it. People we love pass. Situations change. People we thought we'd spend our lives with walk out of our lives. Things happen around us. Children may be unresponsive to your correction. Jobs may be pushed aside or even lost completely. Sorrow is there. We're vulnerable to sin. This sin is always around us. It's easier to sin than it is to be saved. You can find a sin partner almost anywhere. Trying to find someone to pray with you would be difficult. But finding somebody to sin, you can find a sin partner. The ugliest guy, no matter what proportions his physical structure is, We'll find somebody. 
the most beautiful and most unbeautiful will find somebody. We're vulnerable to see, we're vulnerable to sickness. We live in a world where sickness and disease are prevalent. Whether it's hypertension or, or whether it's, 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 it's what you old folks used to call the sugar. <laughs> We're vulnerable to sickness. We're vulnerable. We're vulnerable. I, I, I made this up, so forgive me. We're vulnerable to what I call the social sludge. And, and that, that, that for me is all of the things that happen in society, whether it is the multiple platforms of social interaction of Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. We're vulnerable to all of the social sludge in the world that keeps hitting us and bombarding us. And all of this causes mental wear and tear of life. It's a mental wear and tear. There's a mental wear and tear. We, living makes you vulnerable. And it causes mental wear and tear. Life tears at you. Life tears at you. Life, life pulls on you. Life gnaws on you like a wolverine. It, it, life just, just, just grunts at you. It moves in at you. It, 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 it tries to, to pull you apart. Oh, there are good things in life. There are joyous things in life. There are highs in life. There are peaks in life. There are mountains in life. Those are great. They're wonderful. But there are also lows. Mental Health America suggests that because of the historical adversity faced by black and brown people, because of slavery and sharecropping and race-based exclusions from health and education and social and economic resources, it is translated into not only socioeconomic disparities within black and brown communities, but it also has translated into links to our mental health. Many people are struggling with their mental health. It is not simply something that happened on a day. It's something that has been passed down generationally because of some of the stuff that you inherited is going through. Yeah. My brothers and sisters that are more impoverished, homeless, incarcerated, those who suffer from, from substance abuse problems, even those who are going through seem to have an even greater risk of mental health issues. And let me say this, we've had progress made, and but despite all the progress made, we can still see how alive racism is. With all of the substantial wealth and, and, and security around our dear sister Michelle, and God knows we have to applaud her for, for opening up about a subject, even placing it the way she did. I believe she did that strategically within community not in a public platform not not at a convention but within community she strategically said that so that she could make it available that we could talk about mental health without having it stigmatized and the conversation being pressed aside and nobody wants to talk about what's going on and the real stuff because believe me despite all of the progress you could be wealthy and still be struggling. You, 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 could, you could be financially secure. You could have what, what Big Mama used to call coins mammy. And still be struggling. You, 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 you could go through. Because see, there's one, there's a, a, a YouTube video and maybe even on Facebook of a police officer telling about her experience of being profiled. And here she is, a police officer. She said, because when I take off my uniform, they don't realize I'm a police officer. They just see my skin. Negative stereotypes will cause you to be upset and uprooted. Attitudes of rejection. Things of failure in life. These have what, what is described by mental health workers as measurable consequences. Sooner or later, it starts messing with your mind. 
And don't, don't forget our brothers and sisters who are living below the poverty line, who are twice as likely to report having psychological distress. Don't forget our, our, the times of our people who are feeling sadness. You know, there's, in one survey, it found out that adult black and brown people, particularly African Americans, are more likely to have feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and worthlessness than adult whites. Scary thought. But when you've been pushed down so long, even when the hand is removed, you still feel it. I, I'll, give you, I'll give you an instance. If you keep your wallet in your pocket, you can have your wallet out of your pocket and still think it's there. When you've been pushed down so long, you still feel the press. And lest I be too unsympathetic, I need to say another word. Because we have to be more aware than ever that our young people need us now. That our young people need us. You, you may not realize this, but, but right now, black and brown children are dying and, and and they are they are less likely than than white people to die from from suicide but our teenagers are more likely to attempt suicide brothers and sisters the 2018 national survey on drug use and health in america pointed out this disparity that that kids are, are doing things to themselves. And I only say that right now because in, right in this time now of COVID-19 and this time of racial crisis, this time of, of struggle, you and I need to be on alert that there is a crisis going on within the crisis, within the crisis. We cannot be unaware. We cannot simply act as though nothing is happening. That all of the racism that we see in the world, that all of it has not caught up with us. As a tipping point. You see riots, I see stress. I see people who are feeling vulnerable. Who life has pressed in on and caused them to want to throw up their hands and fight back and say something, do something. I watched the races last night. Uh, there, uh, I was shocked they were, they were having races. I knew it was a, a present day race because everybody in the stands had on masks and there was very few people in the stands and normally at these major races everyone would have on it would be packed in it was in Europe and I saw these two young brothers the Lily brothers you look them up there they just won they came in one and two in the 200 yard dash nearly set a world record what was interesting I saw one of the brothers had on one glove on one hand and the reason he had it on was a reminder of the Olympics. I can't protest much, but something needs to be demonstrated and said in this moment. I got to put a glove on. I got to do something. I, I can't act as though what is happening is not happening. And yes, he had a complete understanding of the vulnerability of people. Secondly, and, and I must move quickly, but secondly, he had a complete understanding of what I call the vicissitudes of the pilgrimage. The vicissitudes of the pilgrimage. Because stuff happens in life. And he had an understanding that it happens. 
stuff happens. There, 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 are, there are vicissitudes. There are things that go wry in life. There are things on our pathway. And, and he understood it. And, and he wanted to place it before God. I, 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 he, he wanted to say, God, when we go through some stuff, will you be there? Will you hear our prayers when we go through? God, when we go through the topography of our journey up and down uh, through the valley of the shadow of death, will you be there, God? He has this understanding. It, it, it comes up in chapter 6. It, it, it reads, verse 28, God, when the famine is in the land, chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles. He says, uh, pestilence or blight or mildew or, or, or locusts or grasshoppers, when, when their enemies besiege them in the land of their cities, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by your people, when each one of knows his own burden and grief and spreads out his hands in this temple, then God hear from heaven in your dwelling place. Forgive and give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know. I, I'll come back to this later. I don't want to really deal with this too strongly now. But what I want to make sure you are aware of is that as Solomon has spoken to the people in his prayer before them, as proclamation before God, he has a complete awareness that, that there's some stuff that happens to us that we did not make happen. Yeah, see, I, I don't know about you, but I don't have a locust farm somewhere. And I don't bring up grasshoppers. I, 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 don't, I try to run and clean off all the mildew I can. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't bring pestilence or blight. I, those I'm not even responsible for. I have no way of creating them. They, they happen around me. They happen to me. And, and I need to be aware, and you need to be aware that, that some stuff that happens in your life is, is, not, is not something that you did. No evil you walked in, no, no, no mistake you made. Some stuff is a part of the pilgrimage. Some stuff is a part of the pilgrimage. And, 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 and you need to realize that some stuff happens ah that's not a satisfactory answer i wish the answer was a little more concrete and give me some more control i wish the answer gave me the answer i wish the answer told me you handle this and it will not happen well let me just be honest stuff happens and guess what now you got to find out how will I deal with what happens in my life? Because how I deal with it says more about me than it does about what happened. Solomon keeps pointing us towards this prayer. Towards this prayer. And, and, and I, I, I got, I got, I've got to close it. I'm, I'm almost to the end. And as I, as I round the bases towards the ending, let me see if I can make this, in the words of my good friend and brother C.L. Stowe, see if I can make this live. He says that all of this is taking place. But I need to recognize something. And here it is, the last part. He has a complete understanding of the vibrancy of his presence. <sighs> the vibrancy of his presence. <laughs> when, when he's talking about God, he said, now God, I need you to make yourself present here. Now I know you are bigger than here, but I need you to be here. Now this is important, you're, that, this is the live part, so stay with me now. I know you're bigger than here, but I need you to be here. I need you to make your presence known vibrantly 
here. Wait a minute. Verse 18 of the same Second Chronicles chapter 6. He says, but, but, but will God indeed dwell with men on earth? Behold heaven and the heavens of the heavens cannot contain you. In other words, I realize that you are bigger than this place here we just built. I realize that the heaven and the heavens of the heavens can't contain you. But I just want to know you're going to be here. God, God, he says, how much less this temple which I have built yet. Regard the prayer of your servant and the supplications, oh my, my God. Listen to the cry and the prayer of your servant is praying before you that your eyes may be open toward this temple day and night toward the place which you went by your name. Wait, 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 wait. What he's saying is, God, I realize how big you are. And I realize you don't have to be here because you're greater than here. But I want to know that you're going to be here when we pray here. So that your presence will be vibrant here. And that you'll move for us here. Come on, I'm about to bless you. The, the good news is that God tries to tell him, not only am I going to be there and you're here, that I'm going to bless you when you call on my name. I'm going to bless you. And, and I thought I would just bless somebody's bones right now. You need to know that God is here. And the here right now is not the Shiloh Church in New London. It's, it's not the building here. No, it is in you. It is in the home where you are now. The car that you're driving in. It, it's in the place where you're sitting at right now. It's in your living room, your dining room, or your bedroom. He, he even is there in your throne room. God is here wherever you are. God is here. Oh, Reverend, how did that, that work if, if he's praying about a temple? Now, you telling me he's here because wherever you are the church is there and God is here in your house or you ought to tell somebody on the line just tell them God is here he, he, you may be in New Haven but say God is here you may be in Oklahoma or North Carolina but you tell them God is here you may be in California or Mississippi but you tell them God is here and you're here is where God is you are here and God is with you and don't you forget it because what we need to know is that the right thing to do right now is to pray and trust God and never doubt. He will surely bring you out. Old folk in my church, and I'm praying for some of my senior saints, Mother Dozier, y'all in my prayers, some of you older mothers and sisters and brothers and y'all I think about you often and coaching y'all because my old folks in church love to sing that song hold to God's unchanging hand and, and my old folk would say something like time is filled with swift transitions not on earth unmoved can stand but build your hopes on things eternal hold to God's unchanging hand. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
on everybody one more time. Sing along with us. Say, oh. just invite you now if you don't know the Lord in the pardon of your sins if you've never given your life to Christ I want you to give your life to Jesus knowing Jesus is the best thing that could ever happen to you you know I'm going to talk more in the next coming weeks about prayer and what it really means but I'm not going to just talk about prayer as in the prayers I pray verbally but also in the actions I take that follow up on my prayers because see, some of you will, will pray, but then you won't take your medicine. You'll pray, but then you won't do what you know you need to do in order to get the answer that you want. What we have to do is to put legs on our prayers. And, and for some of you, that's going to mean, you know, getting therapy. It's going to mean getting help. It's going to mean working things out. But we'll talk more about that. Right now, I want you... If you desire to become part of this family, this fellowship, we're, we're, we're becoming more and more global every day. I invite you to write us right now at churchatmen at shilohcomplex.org or call us at 860-443-6046. Call us. Let us know you want to be a part of this fellowship. We love you, and we know that God is loving you as well. I want you to realize that the God we serve cares greatly about your life. Hold to his unchanging hand. Don't you dare give up. And if you feel like you're going to give up, call a friend. Call the church. Call someone. Don't give up. You need to know God is with you. God loves you. How do I know God loves you? How do I know God, God is with you? Because you're here. You didn't just stop by this word by, by accident. God wanted you to hear this word. God wanted you to know that he loves you and that he cares about you. From the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, God loves you. And I love you too.